Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Mike Force Podcast. It is, of course, your host, Mike G. What's up, YouTube? On the YouTube now. Um, doing podcast on audio and video. The YouTube channel is the Mike Force Podcast. And what I enjoy about this podcast that I do weekly is now I'm able, through the visual medium, of course, is to show you, demonstrate to you things that I'm working on. Like, I don't know, my new ankle holster for med. We, I could talk about it, certainly, and you can listen to me. But if you tune into YouTube and you're one of the YouTubers like me who subscribe to the premium version, you just could let it roll in the background. Listen to audio when you want. But if you want to hear me or watch me run my suck, um, you could do that as well. So, no big deal. Here I am. Uh, welcome back to another week on the Mike Force Podcast. Got a couple additions to add in taking advantage of the visual experience that we have. If you don't follow this podcast or if you listen to the podcast and don't follow on YouTube, follow it at the Mike Force. Hit your notification tabs. You'll be the first to hear or watch. And then um, make sure you subscribe because a lot of people who watch and uh, listen do not subscribe. So do that for me. Um, I'm not asking for you anything, uh, by the way. This podcast is brought to you by uh, partners that I've worked with, including my company that sponsored this podcast, Black Rifle Coffee Company, Phil Craft Survival Company, all these companies that are have made this possible. And we're not asking for anything from you. I mean, if you have to choose a coffee, choose Black Rifle. If you have to choose a preparedness company to get you better prepared, choose the Phil Craft Survival Company. So today on this podcast, we're talking about tactical toxicity. Um, I have some cool names for it, you know, the, the tactical envy, tactical toxicity, um, all these different terms, w which basically is outlining my case for identifying many problems in the tactical industry, but also trying to bring people together and come up with solutions. It's easy to talk crap on a um, social media outlet, a post, a, you know, a story, words, audio, live feeds, the list goes on. The question that you'll, you'll likely ask me is, Mike, where is this coming from? And I'll be fully transparent with, transparent with you because the people who are listening to this podcast who have a disdain for me um, are likely listening to the podcast because they want to collect intel and then use it in some twisted way because that's what these guys do. Um, one, I will tell you, coming from such operations, I, I'm not disloyal to the regiment when I tell you that there's disloyal, toxic, broken people in special operations. That, look, that's the bureaucracy that is the government institution or the institution period. The, the, the bureaucracy that evolves is the nature of the human condition, psychology, and all the things that we are, good and bad. And what happens is a lot of times operators in special operations specifically are insulated. You know, I once heard a special operations guy tell me how unconventional they were, or he was, and his team was, and how irregular warfare and unconventional warfare was their expertise. And I find that, um, even at the time, as he said it, alarming, um, not realistic, and kind of comical. The reason being is... You work for the government. You work for the military. You work for the army in this case. There's nothing unconventional about any military organization. I've been in every major counterterrorism unit um, that means something in the counterterrorism special operations community. I've been in them all. Um, I was in USASOC. I was in Special Forces Command in four different groups. Um, not because I, I, I screwed up, so I bumped around, but I did well, and so I evolved. I was in third group. I was in 10th group. I was in 19th group. I was in South Africa. Um, I've, I've been around for a while. Um, my military experience is in every duty and responsibility and position. Although I was not um, at the tip of the spear as an operator, um, I have operated at the tip of the spear. Let me just put it that way. So um, my disdain for this idea that we are somehow special um, derives from, I think, what I've seen 
special guys do when they get out and they're around people they judge as not being as special. Um, look, it, it, I don't, I don't want to harp on the special operations command or community or culture or brotherhood or whatever you call it, the regiment, um, saying that we're, we're all bad. That's not at all what I'm trying to, um, to speak uh, out loud about. But what I'm saying is those characters that I'm specifically talking about are doing content centered around the idea that if we talk about others, like if we say how bad other people are at their jobs or at what they do, because we constantly judge and we're just being dickheads, let's just be honest, we're just being dickheads about it. You won't go very far in this industry, in this space, and um, you won't last long. I've seen them all. I've seen all. I've seen the toxic special forces guy, the toxic ranger, the toxic CAG guy, the toxic. I've seen them all. The toxic Navy SEAL. I've seen them all. And the trend and the pattern that I've seen is they've all come out. They think it's one way and it's not that way. They fail to adapt. They fail to collaborate and operate well with others. And then they just fail. Then they just hide off somewhere by the, their lonesome and they blame everybody else and they're angry, they're upset, and they're not successful. Let me tell you um, why I'm so um, motivated to talk about this. Because I love my guys. I love members of the Special Operations Committee. That's why. I even love the dickheads who came out and talk crap about me because they're like, who's this guy? What's he doing? Operational security violations, doing all this and all that. And here I am a decade later and there's no dirt on me. Um, yeah, I've, I, I've heard the rumors, but they're, they're not true. Some of them are true. <laughs> Some of them are absolutely true. And I'm not afraid to say they're true, but most are not true. And the proof in my success is, is I'm still here. I run a multi-million dollar tactical business that's doing it right. And, and by the way, when I say that's doing it right, I'm not doing it right. I'm, I'm just leading by hiring and allowing the right people like Sean Kirkwood, like Kevin Owens, like the Matt Vandys of the world to do what they do best. The Acostas of the world, the Shays of the world to do what they do best, which is train without an ego, build rapport and relationships with people and not be a dickhead about it. Um, the big discrepancy for guys who have operated in a very narrow field of expertise is it's just that. It's narrow. Counterterrorism in the five to seven mission sets that you're tasked with, depending on what organization you belong to, is not a direct correlation of, of the success that you'll see as training or running or managing or operating a tactical firearm company. It's just not. I've seen smart, intelligent human beings start tactical companies and yell at their civilian students because somehow they think that that's how you do it. Um, I disagree with that. That's not how you do it, especially if you're trying to teach and mentor. That's not how you do it. It's the same guys that were in the military saying, oh, we don't train indigenous forces. We just kick indoors and shoot people in the face. Well, fine. Yeah, there's a job for that. There's a task for that. But if you want to get involved in the full spectrum of war, you better learn how to train indigenous forces. You better learn counterterrorism, foreign internal defense. You better understand the battlefield and the future of strategic and tactical operations, because it's not just unilateral ops that are going to get you in the door. In fact, it's, it's counterproductive to you getting involved or invested in war in the first place. So those guys eventually came around, but most didn't. So they're the guys that yell at their students. They're the guys who think their tactics are uh, gospel. Like one, if you made up tactics, you, all you did was you take a, a whole bunch of people in your lives uh, ec and your expertise, ideas, and curated them to make something that you think is your own. I don't think any tactic should be a closed forum for discussion. I think every tactical discussion should be an open forum. Why? Because tactics are the way that we tactically respond to human behavior. And guess what? It changes. It changes on the mood, the scenario, the situation, the environment. 
We understand this. You would understand this if you just refer back to your simple planning operation orders, warning orders, fragmentation orders, and analyzing and assessing the enemy situation. So if you're so rigid and compartmentalized in your way of doing things, you've already lost. But okay, but let's, let's take that into the business model um, of the world of tactical training. Um, here's one thing I'll tell you. I've never met an operator or a special operations guy who had it all figured out. The best in the world admittingly said they didn't have it figured out and they were open-minded to discussion. But again, um, when you get guys who live in a bubble, who operate in an echo chamber, who are used to hearing themselves talk out loud and be acknowledged and affirmed, then they go out in the civilian world thinking the world owes them something. So again, here's my, uh, my segments and pieces of advice for those who want to start a firearms, tactical, survival, preparedness company. I, I will tell you, I will give you the key, keys to the kingdom. There's not a survival preparedness tactical company that's bigger than my company. There's companies that do contracting and they make a lot of gross revenue, but there's nobody affecting as many people as, as we are. Uh, I know because I study this and I, and I talk to everybody in the industry and the business. And if there is, slide into my DMs, email me, let me know so I could, so I could hear, so I can understand how to get better and bigger and more evolved. If you want my advice, here it is. One, drop the ego. Nobody needs it anyway. If you want to come into this world and you want to be better at operating in the civilian sector, then be willing to collaborate. Be willing to work well with others and stop thinking that your tactics, techniques, procedures, ideas are gospel because they're not, especially in business. And the ego that you have that is literally in disabling your ability to grow and prosper is what is going to affect your entire success or inability to achieve success. Just like you went to selection, whether you went to selection in Buds, in West Virginia, and, and, you know, Camp McCall, if you want to succeed, it starts with preparation, but it also starts with mindset. And that mindset you need to have is lowering or reducing your ego so you could open your your mind and your heart to different ideas. Phil Craft Survival, despite us doing very well, doesn't have competition because I don't have time to look next to me or behind me for those that are competing with me because I'm on my own track. My guys source and create their own periods of instruction. We are creative, innovative thinkers, and we aren't married to other tactics, techniques, or playbooks and how we evolve our game. That's why we're leading the game. That's why we're leading. So I don't need to look left and right. I don't need to compare and contrast. We will innovate from scratch. Build the right curriculum because it's the right thing to do with the right values instilled. And one of those most significant of values is the lack of ego. My second piece of advice, don't be a dick. There's too many dickheads in the world as it is. I don't care what you were. I don't care if you were an operator. I don't care if you were on the Bin Laden raid. I don't care. Uh, I don't care about your ERB. I don't care about your DD-214. What I care about is your work ethic and your ability to show up consistently, not day after day, but month after month and year after year. Many guys want to work for us. They come up, they show up, they feel entitled. Goodbye. Bye-bye, Felicia. What I want is a guy who shows up, keeps his mouth shut, learns the ropes, and is consistent in stamina by doing the right thing again and again and again, not day after day, not class after class, but year after year. That's what I'm looking for. And to each their own. You don't want to be part of the program? The door, don't let the door hit you in the ass. But many people, because they grow up married to their duties and responsibilities and the position in which they held, think somehow they're invincible. 
I was a sergeant major packing boxes, writing I love you notes to customers that we screwed over because we screwed things up, doing the content on the phone, answering the emails, answering the DMs, showing up on the flat range, managing processes, sweeping the floors, cleaning the shitters again and again and again. But some of you are too good for that. You don't think you think that's above your pay grade. You show up and you think, well, I should be getting paid this much. Really? You think that because the best in the world don't get paid that much. But you want to get paid that much because you retired 20 years in special operations. Well, welcome to the club. And again, I'm being hard on my peers because who else is going to be? But this applies to everybody. The law enforcement guys, the military guys, the civilians, all of those who have these uh, entitled attitudes about things. My last piece of advice would be find a group, a tribe of mentors that is going to lead you in the right direction and collaborate with them. You know who my mentors are? Kyle Lamb. Why? Because Kyle Lamb, retired command sergeant major, Delta Force sergeant major, Kyle Lamb will call me out on my shit. He also prays me where necessary. And so I have a good backstop. If Kyle Lamb ain't chewing my ass out, I feel like I'm in a good position. That's my calibration. That's my azimuth check. But if you live in a echo chamber of all of your bros telling you, yeah, screw that dude. You're doing the right thing. Do you. Then you're in the wrong field of expertise. Because as you evolve in the civilian sector, the toxic behavior, the egos, all the BS that you're used to getting away with are not going to fly. And so all those guys that you think are your buddies right now, they won't be your buddies for long. Eventually, as you filter down through the filtration device, which is life from the military experience you had to the civilian culture you're about to be immersed in, you'll see who your real friends are. Tom, Eagles and Angels. Andy Stumpf, Cleared Hot Podcast. Jack Carr, the Terminalist, New York Times bestselling author. Clay Croft, Expedition Overland. Evan Hafer, Black Rifle Coffee. Matt Best, JT, Logan, Black Rifle Coffee. Trevor Thompson, Black Rifle Coffee. Kyle Lamb, Viking Tactics. These are a group of my peers who are mentors, who are friends, who are partners of mine that are in my small, very small circle. You're going to have to find a new small circle, but I'll be in your circle. I'll support you. As long as you come out with an open mind, not being a dickhead, I'll do anything for you. I'll promote your courses. I'll, I'll hire you. I don't want nothing in return. The only thing I want to do is set you up for success. And that's my motivation here. I'll get off this high horse because it's pissing me off. Hold on one second, guys. I'm so passionate about this because it, because I see so many guys make this mistake. I listened to a live feed the other day where two special operators were talking shit about other guys in the industry and space because they thought they had it all figured out. These guys have been separated from active duty for a couple of years. One a little bit longer than the other. The other just got out. Significant role and and career field in special operations. And he gets out and the first thing he does because he thinks he shoots a pistol well and he thinks he understands tactics that he just talks shit about in the industry. I don't even know if he was talking about me. I, I just take it personally that he's talking about people, period, when he knows better. He's a senior non-commissioned officer in the U.S. military, and he's talking like a private in the 82nd Airborne Division during a field training exercise in a trench in the middle of JRTC. It's like, what are you doing, dude? Grow the F up. Um... And I, I, I can't tolerate it. Here's what I'll do. I'll put the right advice. I'll put out the right all call. But what I won't do is spend a fraction of a second immersed in that toxic behavior. I won't do it. The first time somebody picks up the phone and wants to talk to me about toxic BS, I don't have time for it. When you're leading, when you're winning, you're too busy doing that moving forward. And I don't have time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, didn't mention GVRS, DJ and Cole, uh, my good buddies from Virginia Beach on that list. And so many, so many, many, many more. Um, let's talk about this, this um, lack of accountability. 
So I came out weeks ago and did a critique video on the Burlington Coat Factory shooter who killed a 14-year-old girl. And I'm just going to say that because that's what happened. Um, I received an overwhelming amount of good feedback, positive feedback, because I want to provide the solution. Now, if I was just running my suck as some random ass dude on social media, then that's one thing. But then I got uh, some hate feedback recently that was pretty long and very well thought out. But as I read this person who is a police officer, also a trainer, also owns a tactical company, which I won't announce because I would hate to, I would hate for you to lose any customers based on uh, what I think is your incompetence. But let me just pair a story of this here. In a gist, the guy said, you're right in your criticism, but there's more complexity to the problem. Totally agreed. I mean, saying that I'm right, but also that there's more complexity is an understatement. There's more complexity to many of these situations and scenarios. But like I said in the video, there's only so much that you could snapshot judge. But from what I saw, based on my experience, tethered to what I saw, I made the judgment, the opinion. And I'm entitled to do that. I don't know if you know this. Just like Spotify um, getting a whole bunch of crap over the Joe Rogan podcast, it's like this is a constitutional right. I am talking about an issue in vocal, opinionated form in a conversation. I haven't written this in law, legal doctrine, um, in gospel. This is simply a dude's opinion based on his experience. A lot of assumptions in this guy's argument were made, including the fact that the Burlington Coat Factory uh, assaulter who was shot was indeed shot, which means he had to have got a somewhat of a sight picture. I think I'm uh, quoting there. And, and so he was kind of right. No, no, he wasn't. Um, in fact, he didn't get a sight picture. He got barrel alignment, uh, but that's irrelevant. Here's the overall case in point. After this person said that he doesn't think I should be making opinions because that officer might hurt himself or that department might point the blame or that officer might be judged in court at, in a court of law. Here's the reality of the situation. A 14-year-old girl is dead. I, I, how, how does it get any more real than that? And the accountability of the rounds of that officer, which were shot um, out of his rifle, weren't accountable. Because one of the rounds went, whether it went through, whether it ricocheted, I, I think it simply went through and through the wall and into the girl. A 14-year-old girl lost her life. So if a police officer loses his job, if a department um, uh, undoes its uh, whack policy of not training its law enforcement officers, if institutional change happens for the better because of my opinion, then so be it. I'm not in the business of coddling law enforcement officers, nor anyone. If you, if you haven't told from or haven't um, got this from my tone of the way Mike Glover operates, I don't give a shit. And I hate to be that frank with you, but some people just need frankness. I don't care. I, 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 I do not care about hurting law enforcement's feelings or people's feelings for that matter when it comes to the right. And you know I'm right. Because in your own confession, you stated again and again, even though I think you're right, it's still, we shouldn't do this. Shouldn't do what? Call each other out? Have experts call you out with trying to repair what's broken? The culture that you come from, even in your verbiage of how you wrote your, your testament to me, is the problem. The problem is we don't want to be held accountable. Because we're too PC for that. Let the politicians in your department be PC for that. But let's at least hold each other accountable. 
Let's at least be uh, men enough to stand up and go, damn, I'll take it on the chin because I was wrong. I made a mistake. I accidentally killed this girl. And that's hard to live with. I get it. I get it. It's hard to live with. But guess what? You're going to have to live with it. The best thing we could do is identify weakness so we can make that our strength. So it never happens again. Now, after this, I I launched this um, uh, engagement and I had many people reach out to me from the LAPD. In fact, with Route 66 Sports Shooting Park in likely March, I will be training two courses, one for the California Highway Patrol and one for all the officers in San Bernardino and the Los Angeles County area, including the LAPD. In two days, as many damn law enforcement officers I could fit into two days, I will train for free. It's my commitment to law enforcement for identifying problems and then coming up with soluble solutions. I just had recently um, some members of the Houston Police Department reach out to me that were involved in the shooting that I critiqued. And several of my assumptions were right, and several of them have been clarified because they were wrong. So let's talk about it. On this day, on this particular video, you have a shooter who gets in a pursuit with law enforcement. Three officers show up on the scene in this particular case, in this particular segment of video, and the suspect exits, exits the video or exits the vehicle on the video and mag dumps on all three of them immediately shooting and wounding too. I I didn't mention this, but it was articulated to me that one of the members was shot in the arm and receded or retreated to get out of the way because he was this dominant arm. And, you know, we've been taught in the military, and I agree with this, if you're not an asset, you're a liability. So get the hell out of the way. And he did so smartly. Another officer who was um, closing the distance on the suspect, was shot in the foot. Um, Not realizing he was hit, he pursued, and many of these officers who were hit were pursuing the suspect as as he was running down. One of the criticisms I had was, why didn't they drop this dude where he stood even while he was running with his back turned? Because according to Houston police rules of engagement or their use of force policy, They can use deadly force, even shooting a suspect in the back, as long as in in this case, they could articulate the threat to the public that he was. And he definitely was because he had a a firearm in his hand. Now, what I've been uh, clarified on is the reason they didn't shoot is because, and and I am completely and wholeheartedly in agreement with this, is... One of the officers that was shot in the foot had a shot or had a clear lane for a shot, but identified civilians that were beyond and behind the suspect, which one of the rules, basic rules or principles of firearm safety is know what your target is and know what's beyond your target because bullets go through bad guys. So he he weighed that and didn't want to be a risk to the public. I never said the officer that was shot in the arm was cowardice. I don't, I, in fact, aggressively after identif- one in the initial watching of the video, I'm like, dude, these, these cops have balls of steel. They're pursuing an armed suspect um, that could easily turn around and mag dump again, and they're doing so aggressively. These dudes were not passive officers. I don't know their backgrounds totally. But I do know they were veterans, and I do know they were aggressive officers that were doing the job the right way. But he didn't have a clear shot. So as he was carjacking a lady and got ripped, ripped her from her car, he opened up on another officer and shot that officer in the femur. And man, he's lucky. He's lucky. They did render aid to him on, on site. He's going to have more wounds to deal with. More damage was done. Um, But again, they're trying to interdict this guy, prevent him from 
doing bad things to good people. And what I didn't hear, which I want to clarify, is one of the officers did unload um, on the suspect as he was attempting to flee uh, after shooting and injuring multiple officers. One of the officers was able to get rounds off in the vehicle. One of those rounds actually hit the suspect in the back of the nugget. And just like rounds do, because rounds do weird things, scalped them and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm parastoring here. Um, I'm exaggerating here and lodged in the sinus cavity. So um, based on that injury and being a barricaded suspect is likely what ended the shooting spree. Just like my officer from Midway, Texas, that stopped an active shooter after he was shot in the face, losing his eye. This officer, these officers put their lives in harm's way and were able to stop the act of shooting. Uh, who knows if they didn't do what they did offensively, how this would have worked out. Let me tell you why these officers were successful in at least getting this guy to a point where they could put a bullet in him and stop him from hurting or harming more people because they had military tactics. That's why. That's, that's the simple answer. They had military tactics. Law enforcement across this nation, with few and rare exception, teach, shoot, move, and communicate, or small unit tactics to their officers. California Highway Patrol, I, as, a, as far as I know, I was one of the first tactical instructors to go in there uh, last year or the year before last and teach them how to shoot, move, and communicate. Cover me while I move. Those basic infantry tactics are very important when you talk about officers, especially patrol officers, that are w working as singleton operators that will show up on the scene of an accident with multiple patrol officers, and they have to quickly command and con uh, coordinate a tactical effort, a battle drill tactic against a formidable foe. So not understanding how to lay a base of fire or support by fire, not understanding how to flank and maneuver, not understanding hand and arm um, signals and communication with each other. That is a detriment to our law enforcement and their inability to do their job effectively. These guys were able to mutually support each other because they worked the same shifts. They trained together. They're uh, former veterans and military um, uh, trained, and they care about their job. There's a lot of officers in law enforcement who are complacent, who, like I described, don't like the accountability aspect. Look, it, my team in special operations, I would hold them accountable because I was going to, as their leader, exceed the standard. And I expected that I would exceed the standard. And so I expected nothing less of them. So we train hard. I, I just talked to my company commander, my, Matt Breitbach, in reflection. Matt was telling me how he thought my team was the best uh, trained team that he'd ever seen. Why? Because he saw us always training doing CQB, doing PT, uh, doing technical training, working on the range, working in the gym, because we took it seriously. That's, that's not me inflating my ego here. That's me instilling upon you, imparting upon you where you need to be to be the best in the world. The institution is not going to give you enough time to accomplish that. So we need to do it together. My pledge, my personal pledge, my company's pledge in the six different iterations of training that I have in the, in the following year of training law enforcement for free is we will do our best to make sure law enforcement is trained. I will go out of my way. I will use every company resource. I will use every Black Rifle coffee. I will, I will talk to Andy Stumpf about how we could work with him and offering jujitsu for, for law enforcement officers. We will do whatever we can to protect those that protect our communities because that's what they deserve. Big shout out to all those officers I've talked to in recent past over the last couple of weeks. I hope to train with you soon. And I'm proud of you guys. I'm proud of you men and women. This last weekend, I just trained a uh, survival preparedness uh, workshop and had law enforcement that were there and present because they take it, they're taking it seriously. Oh, how can we help? Well, how can you help? I'm going to start the Philcraft Foundation, which we're waiting on 501c3 approval. 
that's going to start pulling these resources to train these subject matter experts to train you. The right men who are willing to volunteer their time to train you, not just on tactics, on mindset, on first aid. The list goes on. The institution is not going to fix this problem. The bureaucracy, the, the corruptness of these politicians is not going to fix this problem. The American people will. We're good at that. In private industries, that's what we do, and we'll fix the problem. Um, hope to get out to Houston really quick and train with them. Um, I, I've offered it up, and I'll offer it up again. If there's any police officers in the Houston Police Department or the local sheriff's department of that county, I will come out and offer a training session for a weekend for free, all on me. I'll travel on me. I'll just show up with guns and we'll get hot. We'll do mindset. We'll do resilience. We'll do uh, psychology. We'll do uh, training uh, with pistol, with carbine. We'll do vehicle dynamics. We'll do it all. That's my pledge to you guys. All right, let's talk about some things I got going on in the near, near future. Uh, This weekend, if you haven't heard, me, Andy Stumpf, Jack Carr, Professional Development Leadership Workshop. We are doing that uh, in-house. It's an eight to four o'clock event. Breakfast and lunch is included. And then we got dinner that's going to be served up at Philcraft HQ. That's already sold out. You can get in the workshop still from eight to four. It's where me, Andy, and uh, Jack Carr share experiences entrepreneurship and leadership. The first couple hours is a leadership block where we talk about um, the challenges that we faced. Then we do a workshop of leadership and entrepreneurship with Andy with a two-hour block and me and Jack in a two-hour block, and then we swap and rotate after lunch. And then that night, we break bread, answer your questions, and focus on how we can make you better as individuals. It's a good time. Um, We'll be offering this with Jack and Andy hopefully a couple times a year. The next one will involve Kevin Owens and Zach, uh, former Green Beret. Um, uh, hopefully, I know he's going, he's having surgery soon, but soon he might be available. Um, we also have um, a couple special operations guys that are active duty right now. Uh, one, a Silver Star recipient. Uh, great dude. I won't mention his name because just in case he can't make it, we have a good lineup of leaders of, of men and women who have been through difficult circumstance and uh, um, are, are epic personalities to give you all the cliff notes of their experience. Also, um, planning this rally segment. Uh, I already got dates uh, to do filming with Travis Pastrana. Big shout out to Travis. A big shout out to Black Rifle Coffee uh, that is sponsoring Travis now. Look forward to all the cool and rad things they have going on. If you haven't already seen it, my boy BJ Baldwin's been crushing it with his trophy truck. Um, it's amazing the turnaround you could have when you're working with the right people. And it's cool to see that. Black Rifle Coffee Motorsports with JT, we're, we're headed in the right direction. And uh, these guys are, are, are up and coming and they're blowing the world up, man. They're doing really well. Travis Pastrana just did Jim Connor. If you haven't heard, he got injured. I hope you heal up real quick, brother. Um, hope you can get back to it, and hopefully I'll be filming with you really soon. Uh, if you didn't uh, notice it, I've been building a rally car uh, in the background, but this year I'm racing on the Black Rifle Coffee team, and I'll be the driver for the Black Rifle Coffee car, thanks to Evan and JT who have allowed me to do that. Um, I will be racing as a rookie in the American Rally Association, the ARA, My first race is in March, March 18th and 19th for the American Rally Association in Salem, Missouri. I have no idea where that's at. Um, I thought it was like the Salem Witch Trials. It's not that. But Salem, Missouri, my team will be out there. I'll be out there. I'll be dropping in on Mike.a.glover and Mike Glover Actual so you guys can come out and see me, break bread, drink coffee, and then um, watch me hopefully not crash. I'm super excited about that venture and just stoked for it. I also have been uh, following Life Motorsports. Life uh, ran by Cole and his crew, um, Pikes Peak champion, um, um, uh, renowned motorsports racer, and is doing epic stuff. He's about to, this June, take a um, carbon fiber, essentially, GTR Skyline up Pikes Peak in a diesel setup. Yes, turbo diesel setup. Um, he's going to go after the diesel record 
and then uh, do that run in, su- in sub-10. Uh, huge accomplishment, huge feat. This year, hopefully with Cole, I'm going to be building a Pikes Peak car that is going to be fully sponsored. And what I intend to do is hopefully, we haven't bridged this gap yet, but if you know anybody, you guys can email me at mike.philcraftsurvival at gmail.com. Again, that's mike.philcraftsurvival at gmail.com. I'd like to bring that car around before the race, which is the following June, and bring it around to St. Jude's Hospital that, if you haven't heard, doing great thing with great things for children, bring awareness to those children, especially after COVID, who have spent a lot of time isolated, and bring them out, uh, show them the cars, um, bring out Black Rifle co- Coffee, the helicopter, do a whole bunch of cool and rad stuff for these kids. I have a special place in my heart for these kids because uh, many of them are suffering from um, illness and ailment and disease that is life affecting and altering. And anything that we could do to bring a smile on their face, I would love to do that. My plan is to uh, bring out paint and have them uh, take their little hands and stick it in paint and stick it on my um, um, supercar. So that way when I race to the top of Pikes Peak, not next year, but the year after, um, they're going along uh, on that ride with me. Um, I think that's super important. Um, Also, lastly, before we get to uh, some of the things I want to talk to you about, let's talk about um, South Africa. So if you're not following what's going on in South Africa, uh, you're not the only one. Many people are not following it. Hold on one second, guys. The reason that a lot of people aren't following it is because COVID and all the socioeconomic issues, the politics, the toxic crap is distracting us from the real issues that are going on in the world. You know who's winning? Terrorists are winning. Because terrorists in Afghanistan who have been armed, who have been loaded down with equipment, who basically have their own military now, um, terrorists in Syria, terrorists all over the world, including in Africa, where this is uh, uh, truly affecting us, um, are poaching animals and using it as a means to fund terrorism. It's a huge problem. I was briefed on it when I was in the military, and I certainly see it now with all the things going on in the world. I'm talking to a couple of subject matter experts on it because we do want to do a documentary in South Africa because 75% of the rental population over the last decade um, of recent, this just came out in uh, January 20-something, has been decimated, and we, before we know it, are going to lose all of that. And we're not paying attention. Next thing you know, it's gone. That's how it works. It's just like freedom. They take a little bit of power, <coughs> a little bit of control, and the next thing you know, it's completely gone. See that right there? That's freedom right there. Uh, every podcast episode, I'm going to put up a different picture in the background. This is 366, Operational Detachment Alpha 366, my ODA on a mountain team in 3rd Special Forces Group in my 05 rotation. Many dudes that I love right there including Master Sergeant Ben Bittner, who gave his life, who was killed in combat. Uh, Digress, but um, expect to see a documentary out of us this summer. I hope to go with Clay from X Overland. I hope to go with Jack Carr. Um, I hope to bring awareness to a very significant issue. Um, All right, let me cover some things that I wanted to show you because I can only show you these things. It's cool. I could talk about, I'll do my best to articulate it to you as well. But if you haven't seen this, this is our new ankle holder from Philcraft Survival. Um, One of the tactical reasons you should hold your med kit on your ankle or on your person is when you need first aid, you need it now. So I wanted to reduce the amount of time between assessment of an injury and treatment of an injury. Imagine you're overlanding, off-roading, and then you assess, oh, there's an injury. Well, to go all the way back to the vehicle to get the med equipment and then go all the way back to the casualty, which I've done in real life, is saving life precious moments that can render aid. It's why the acronym March or Mars has changed from ABCs because you could be uh, breathing um, labored in respiration and circulation, and that could be addressed with some time. But when you start bleeding out of your body, the massive hemorrhaging, it doesn't repair itself. Uh, You need a higher level upgrade of care. And so neglecting that 
could mean the difference between life or death. So we didn't make this with like, oh, this is going to be Gucci because I'm going to put a low-vis gun in here. Um, that's stupid. You're not going to carry a pistol on your ankle. I mean, if you do, it's a very specific reason. I have done that before with a Glock 26, but it's very specific. Um, what I do recommend is you carry a spare mag, um, which we made this slot for mag, not a tourniquet. And then you carry stop the bleed kit, basic hemorrhage response and control. So that's a combat gauze or coagulant um, immersed into a cavitational wound to be able to, to absorb and create a coagulant to stop that bleed in conjunction with compression. Even mine, I carry a survival blanket, a Mylar space blanket, because I want to be able to treat the casualty and control their core body temperature so their uh, temperature doesn't crash on them. Um, I don't even recommend carrying the tourniquet on this because the tourniquet's too bulky. You're likely not going to use that if it's too bulky. So this is the recommended setup, and I wanted to show you that because you can get it on PhilCraftSurvival.com, and I'm proud of it, guys. I, I worked really hard with my team. My team busted their ass to make this the right piece of equipment at the right price point for you, and I hope you guys take that seriously. Um, lastly, I want to get to this because this is pretty special. Um, I've gotten one of the first P365 uh, variants. That's the P365 XL Comp. Now, this pistol, I'm going to clear that. This pistol, um, I'm going to do a YouTube video on tomorrow comparing the 365 XL standard to the 365 XL comp. Now, I've been harping SIG to do comp guns because, um, especially in the compact form, it is especially important because short, smaller guns, because of the Rico operating rod and basic physics of the gun, are snappier in muzzle flip. So I separate two things. Muzzle flip and recoil are two different things. Muzzle flip is the barrel rises. Recoil, the barrel rises and sometimes drives the gun to the rear, but they're two separate things. So you could manage recoil easily with a large, good grip on an XL, because an XL, even though it's more compact, um, or more full size than a compact, uh, I would call it a subcompact, um, has a very narrow grip for a larger hand to control that recoil, but muzzle flip is still going to be there. Now, supposedly, this comp, which is OEM as a comp, most compensation is done aftermarket. This is a original equipment um, from the manufacturer that is going to comp and reduce your muzzle flip by about 30%. That is massive. Now, there's a discrepancy between the costs. Now, this has titanium nitride, nitride as a coating, um, which is going to make it slicker. There's a whole bunch of cool Gucci components to this. Um, even has cool uh, stippled, hand stippled grip as on the module. But is it worth it? Well, here's where we get to the point of tactical advantage. Um, I mean, I'm going to test it, and I'm going to tell you if it's worth it. I don't care of our partnership with any gun manufacturer, if it's not working, I'm not going to tell you it's going to work. I'm going to test it. I'm going to do it cold. I'm going to do it with no apologies. And if it sucks, it sucks. And if it's good, it's good. But to, to be told that there's a reduction of 30% in muzzle flip is massive. And I'm going to demonstrate that. Uh, you can see it right here on the video, um, getting you a good presentation of this and the serrations of the comp. This compensation does not take place in the barrel. And if you've ever compensated a gun via the barrel, what you're going to do is get a lot of brass in your face. Um, that's speaking from experience versus the compensation in this particular case that comes from the slide um, that is broken off on the exit of the barrel. So you don't get the round rotating through the port of the port uh, cut in the barrel while it's rotating in its lands and grooves you get all that compensation happening in air right outside the barrel. And I think that's genius. Uh, I think it's clean and I'm going to test it and let you know how good it is. Uh, the reason I would advocate for this for a, a compact pistol is because the smaller the gun, the more muzzle flip, generally speaking, you're going to get. And if that's the case, we want to reduce our split times on target by having reduced split times or the time in between shots but allowing the pistol to muzzle flip and settle in the same spot. 
Yeah, sure, you could have fast muzzle splits as you're stitching the target. While the gun, you're pulling the trigger, the gun muzzle flips, you break the trigger and reset and pull the trigger again as the gun hasn't even settled and then walk the rounds up the target. But that's not what I want to do. I want to put the rounds where I intend to put them in quick succession. So I want the gun to muzzle flip rapidly and index in the same spot. And that's going to reduce my overall muzzle, muzzle flip time. And if I can get a 30% reduction, you're going to see a quicker time, uh, theoretically, in the split time. That means more rounds faster on target, especially in a combat scenario where I might not have the ideal grip situation. It might not be out of the box uh, two hands. It might be single grip. So in my video, I'm going to compare and contrast the two of them, but I'm also going to do it strong-handed and also weak-handed to assess the difference. We'll talk about split times. We'll talk about all the intricacies of this uh, in the video, which I'm pumped about. I'm super pumped about. So the SIG 365 XL um, made by Custom Works Department of SIG known as the 365 XL Comp, essentially is what's going to be called. Guys, we're at an hour. Uh, I want to say big shout out to uh, all the listeners of this podcast, all the watchers of this podcast now. If you listen to the podcast, make sure you subscribe on the YouTube and watch. Uh, give, it a, give it a try. I'm a big fan of the YouTube format. Uh, lastly, a lot of you have asked me about the Wolf 21. Do want to give a shout out to the Wolf 21. Uh, if you go to thewolf21writtenout.com, um, actually, it's the Wolf 21, number 21.com. You guys could find my company that I made for sleep and for uh, ailment. Um, CBD, which is part of the cannabinoid receptin system, um, that, res- that system, um, when infused with natural cannabinoids, um, including CBD, CBG, CBN, uh, will increase your performance, focus, um, as well as improve your sleep and pain. I deal with all of those. I have TBI, so I deal with focus issues. So I use tactical uh, tincture, uh, which is called tactical response in the morning to give me a little boost. I drop it in my black rifle coffee and it, it kick starts my day. Throughout the day, depending on the day I am having, I have chronic compressed disc, chronic pain in, uh, up and down my spine. Um, I'll use CBD. CBD does not make you feel high, guys. This is not THC derived. This is hemp derived with no THC. And then finally, um, when we look at the CBN component, it is the part of the cannabinoid receptor that makes you sleepy, that makes you feel relaxed. It doesn't make you feel high. It makes you feel relaxed. I take a bed down, which is CBD and CBN every single night, and I get a solid seven hours of sleep. I monitor on my aura ring, and I encourage you to do the same. Go try it out if you like it. Subscribe. If not, hey, man, no harm, no foul. But the testimonials and the proof is in the pudding. Because the first launch of this, I gave it to Evan, Evan Hafer, Tom, Matt, all my buddies who deal with the similar issues that I have, and it's helped them out profoundly. And I hope it helps you. Guys, till next time, peace out, and hope you have a good week. Later, guys.